Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at c a c h e f l y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Are you escorting the ship? And Anakin's like, uh, yeah, actually, I am. And the pilot keeps fanboying out. He's like, oh my gosh, I could not believe that in my wildest dreams I'd be flying alongside Anakin Skywalker. Uh, uh, the name's Owen Lars. Like I said before, I'm shaking things up a bit. But you know, the term uncle doesn't need to be familial. And in Owen and Anakin becoming closer, it makes sense as to why he would be taking care of Luke. And really, when you look at George's version, Owen's exposure to Anakin is super weird. Just think about this for a second. You're hanging out in your moisture farm when suddenly some dude who you've never met shows up and says that he's the son of the slave that your father bought and married. And when he finds out that she's been kidnapped, he takes off, leaving you to engage in awkward conversation with this overly dressed woman he showed up with while he mindlessly goes ape shit on a ton of sand people, then comes back with the body, grieves briefly at the funeral, then leaves. And then years later, another dude who you've never met shows up with the murderer's son. Would you really take that child in? And go, go, go! Welcome to Frame Rate episode 138. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood, and that was Belated Media doing their thing that they do so well. What if episode two was good? And he does something awesome because he proposed, he put together, if you like the red letter media reviews that excoriate the Phantom Menace, he basically did a positive spin on it saying instead of tearing it down, he built it up and came up with a version that would be fantastic and hit all the same beats. He it's builds like on one this. forms the other, right? If you yeah. look at red letter media, like this is what was wrong. And then belated media comes in and goes, all right, let's fix it. Absolutely. Well, and, and what's interesting is because he made changes in the first episode, you see that the second episode still needs to hit those same beats, but it needs to veer farther off to the side. And slowly he's like creating his own mythos. Like I've already said this before. I want to scrub the actual prequels from my mind and only remember this as what the prequels was. Uh, and it's fantastic work. We had him on NSFW last year and uh, thrilled that he uh, launched episode two. Check it out. Belated Media. Watch both of those. What if episode one was good and what if episode two was good? And now, what if we did the big story? Hey, I guess that would happen. There. This just in, the big story. Everybody is telling me about the Kevin Spacey clip. I don't know about you, Brian, but I have been deluged with people, like even like one minute before the show started. Hey, have you seen that Kevin Spacey clip? That Kevin Spacey clip is amazing. You should watch that Kevin Spacey clip. Yeah, it's almost as though like Kevin Spacey got on, on in front of a huge audience, stood up to the podium and said, I believe that you should be able to watch what you want, when you want, and on whatever damn device you choose. And I aim to give you the info to do it. And we're like, oh, wait, that's frame rate. But that's pretty much what I believe. I'm Kevin Spacey. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, that's a perfect uh, introduction to the clip. <laughs> Check this out. The audience wants the control. They want the freedom. If they want to binge, as they've been doing on House of Cards and lots of other shows, then we should let them binge. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have stopped me on the street and said, thanks, you suck three days out of my life. <laughs> and through this new form of distribution, we have demonstrated that we have learned the lesson that the music industry didn't learn. Give people what they want, when they want it, in the form they want it in, at a reasonable price, and they'll more likely pay for it rather than steal it. Well, Welcome to Frame Rate, the show that thinks you should be able to watch the stuff you love when you want, where you want, and on whatever damn device you choose, and aims to give you the info you need to do it. Welcome, Kevin Spacey. Uh, oh, you know, we have God. Dana Brunetti, uh, who works Trigger Street Media with Kevin Spacey, so maybe some of that has seeped over. I don't know. But uh, everybody's going wild about this because he got up at the Edinburgh TV Festival and spoke to the industry and said, look, don't make the mistakes that the, uh, the music industry is making. 
give the people stuff the way they want. And he talks a lot about watching on an iPad is the same as watching in a movie theater. You're watching content. You're telling stories. Stories are what's important. It's not important to except to lawyers and deal makers about what screens these are on. Now, we also have a lot of other stuff going on this week. Uh, Variety, uh, Andrew Wallenstein, whom, whom we've had on the show before, had a great article talking about binge viewing uh, and, and how there's binge viewing is like a bad term because there are binge viewers who watch like three or four episodes at a time. And then Wallenstein says, I'm, I'm more of a space it out because with Breaking Bad, he couldn't handle more than one episode in a row. So he'd watch one episode a day. And he speculated, eventually we may come up with lots of different release schedules that are variations on binge viewing. Yeah, I, I, I'm betting we won't, though, because I think uh, what makes binge viewing binge viewing is parking yourself at the all-you-can-eat buffet. Now, that doesn't mean that you're, you are going to plow through and eat everything at the buffet, but you are in control. It is there for you. You could come, eat whatever you want, however you want, and we consider that to be the, you know, the binging experience. And the same thing is true for our media. In this case, Andrew talks about how he intended to just plow through all of Breaking Bad in a day and get caught up and hey, that was easy. Now I'm ready to be caught up with everyone else for the last season. But was so struck by the, you know, by the content in the show that he realized it was, you know, to again go back to the eating metaphor, it was too heavy a meal and he wasn't going to plow through a whole bunch. He decided that this is a once a day thing. It was too heady. It was too much. And, um, you know, when we went through uh, House of Cards, uh, you know, we didn't sit and watch it all in one day. I didn't sit and watch uh, arrested development all in one day. It's like you you find your own comfort based on your schedule, your ability to consume, and the nature of the the art that you're consuming. So, but yes, I think it's fine to label all of those derivations, all of those variations as the binge watching experience in general. I don't see the need to parse it, and and I don't know. I agree with everything Andrew said. I don't know that we need to change the perception of what it means to binge view, though. Well, I don't know if we need to change the perception, but I like what he's saying about there may be different release schedules that, that people just aren't even thinking about it right now. Maybe a broadcaster, like a traditional broadcaster, decides, you know what, I think this is most suited to putting out the episode every day. That's how people are going to best want it. So let's dole it out slowly like that. Others are going to say, you know what? Let's let them decide. Let's just put it all out. And that's kind of what Kevin Spacey's saying. Just put it all out there and let people figure it out. Although there, there are articles out today, too, saying Netflix is starting to realize, uh-oh, too many people binged House of Cards. Well, they did not too many people, but they binged faster than we thought. And so we can't amortize the cost of the show over as many months as we thought we would be able to. And, and that means the cost of the show can be parsed out and divided by the number of months people watch it if you have a longer viewing period. And so that starts yeah. to make make you wonder like, well, maybe it is best if you put it out four episodes a month or something like that. And I could see something like that happening. Uh, in fact, depending on the type of epic story that you'd be telling, I could see, uh, you know, having six episodes at a time come out once a month for three or four months straight for a larger story. Uh, I, I hope they don't because here's the thing is as a customer of Netflix, I'm not going to... I'm not going to unsubscribe. It's like you already bought me. You own me. Yes, as long as two or three times a year you come out with anything original of the quality of Orange is the New Black or House of Cards or, or even Lilyhammer, uh, I'll I'll stick around. I'm not going anywhere. So it's like you do your accounting any way you want. You got me. And and, well, and I don't see the point of the freaking thing, out outside the, of that. The, the point isn't about your viewing habits. The point is if they can afford to keep putting new stuff in the pipeline as often as you need it. If they can say House of Cards costs $12 billion or $12 million, which is not what it costs, but just for an example, we're and we think it's going to roughly have equal viewership over 12 months, then we can say that's a million dollars a month that comes off the balance sheet. And, and we can right. handle that because we've got an increasing number of subscribers. If it's $12 million, $6 million comes in the first month, $3 million the second month, $3 million the next month, all of a sudden... That first month now costs them a lot of money that they don't they no longer have on the balance sheet, which means that they can't afford to spend as much money for a couple of months yet. Now, speaking of House of Cards, I wonder if this changes the math at all. With House of Cards, you could I could see a scenario where they put this idea into practice starting next year. They uh, you know, they release season two of House of Cards, but they release it as two releases, you know, uh, one in January and the next in, you know, March or whatever. So they're three months apart and you get six episodes on one, six episodes on another. Uh, but I wonder if they could factor in, especially for House of Cards, which was a two-season deal, I wonder if they could factor in 
the 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 run up of people binging the first season in preparation for the release of the second season. Yeah, as I'm part sure of the, that's going to happen. Yeah, that's that's definitely going to have an effect, and they should they should account for that. There's also a great story on uh, L.A. Times today by Don Schmielewski about Ted Sarandos, the guy who's responsible for putting together all these deals. And something I didn't realize until I read this story is that he was the guy who went and broke ground by getting all those documentaries. Remember, Netflix used to be known for like, oh, they've got these great documentaries. That was their first foray, foray into acquiring original content, saying like, okay, documentarians, make this for us. Wait, and so when they, when they first said, we're going to acquire original series, they got, according to this article, piles of crap things with coffee stains on them that had obviously been through every studio in town and been rejected. And as soon as they got House of Cards on board, suddenly they started getting calls from top tier people producing shows. And that, and, and Ted Sarandos gets a lot of the credit in this article for it. Yeah, it's easy to uh, to overstate terms like uh, visionary, but, but everything I read from this article, and you should read the full LA Times article, it's really exceptional. Uh, I mean, it sounds visionary. The fact that that in a time when everyone is consumed with with pilots and release schedules and and ending on cliffhangers or whatever, to take the view of not only we're going to do long form content, we're going to believe in the in the story, uh, but also his continuing decision to support uh, not releasing the viewership numbers. I think that's my favorite part of the article is talking about how it's enraging the the old school media types. Uh, uh, Jenji Cohen. Says uh, here's the quote: "People go bananas." Says uh, Cohen of Orange is the New Black. I had a lunch with an unnamed executive who spent half the time ranting. If it was good news, they tell us like they just couldn't handle that they weren't releasing the the numbers, the viewership numbers, because that's just not what they're out to do. They're they're out to build buzz. They're out to get a reputation for high quality content, and they're out to drive subscribership numbers. And how many people watch them it don't matter. None of your bees. None of your bees. Yeah. And uh, frankly, I'm 100% with Kevin Spacey. Uh, he is, I think he's absolutely right. Story is what people care about. Eventually, the distinction between movies and television won't really even matter. Something like Harry Potter is a series. It's just a really big, expensive series over yeah. eight movies, right? Uh, so I, it'll be interesting how we reach that land, but I think that's there, where we're going to end up. Someday. There was also uh, one other thing that uh, I don't know if it was in the speech or in the, the article commenting about the speech was the idea that uh, we have a shorter attention span than ever. Uh, he's like, uh, I think it was Kevin Spacey who said, uh, no, people are sitting down and spending 12 full hours. You know, that's that's the longest movie most people will see all year. And and if anything, you know, we're, we're having longer attention spans because we're able to manage our time more effectively. And we're able to tell a level of complexity in moving pictures that, that has never happened. That's why we're able to finally take dense, epic books like Game of Thrones and make that happen. Hemlock Grove. Let's move on to another big story. <laughs> Stop everything. It's another big story. Google reportedly in meetings with the NFL. Now, don't get too crazy. Apparently, they do this every year because they've got all kinds of partnerships going on already with YouTube. But Larry Page and uh, the head of content for YouTube were together in Mountain View talking with the commissioner, Roger Goodell. And there's a lot of people saying it came up in the meeting that Google might be interested in buying NFL Sunday ticket. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's U.S. football. It's a big deal right now. DirecTV has the contract, but their contract ends after the 2014 season. So in 2015, after the playoffs are over, after everything's done, NFL Sunday ticket is available for somebody to buy. Yeah, I. Uh, one of the other articles you linked in the same story was about uh, Mark Cuban maybe softening his hard line edge against live video over the web. And he mentions he mentions some legitimate concerns like um, the fact that especially – when it comes to content like the NFL, you have uh, you have gamblers, you have fantasy sports enthusiasts, and they simply will not tolerate more than a 10 second lag for because after beyond that, it doesn't feel live. And they're seeing tweets about a pass before they're able to see it on there. And there's certain infrastructure things that need to happen in order to get this out. And he says that uh, you, Google is able to reach. I think he says 20 million now, maybe 30 million next year. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if he's got inside information on there, but uh, but it definitely sounds like even somebody who has been essentially a stalwart of of old media, traditional media, supporting HDNet, even though he's uh, you know major investor in Revision Three uh, now Discovery. Um, you know, I, it's it seems like everybody's coming around, man. I mean, do you think do you th is 
We've been asking for three years now, Tom. Is this the revolution? Is this finally uh, our point of view coming around? I have a feeling reading all these stories today that we are on the cliff looking down like Moses into the promised land at the revolution. And, and we're all looking at Apple, Google, Sony, and Intel as the people who are likely to start taking us down the trail. Maybe all four of them, maybe one or two of them, maybe just one of them. Uh, and, and Google is, is talking to, to the NFL. You know, they, <laughs> they're up there at the top of the mountain saying, you could make us. Because if we get the NFL, then we could start adding, you know, other partners and eventually we would win the online service. If I were the NFL, man, I'd be considering doing this myself, maybe in a partnership with Google to get me off the ground because you're, Mark Cuban's right. You need a huge amount of bandwidth to stream this stuff reliably. But can you imagine if the NFL sold you a box? It's the NFL box. You buy it and you get the first year, all the NFL games free, and then you now just re-up every year? The problem, of course, is that, um, uh, I mean, first of all, there's infrastructure concerns with that. And, uh, you know, NFL is, of course, very much a, you know, a, a rural uh, pastime for a lot of people who are going to have restrictions on bandwidth. And what would doing this kind of bold, exclusive, online-only package deal do to uh, their existing agreements? I mean, could, could you picture a, a place where, you know, I don't know who covers the NFL, but, but you know, when major networks are no longer offering the big well it's not it's not about who covers it it's about who has the games right cbs fox nbc have nfl games those aren't going away those deals last for a long time so we're not going to see any real sports revolution here in fact a bigger revolution might be the story here from bloomberg that espn has been holding talks about internet only service they're basically saying you're going to have to pony up and you're going to have to take all our channels there's no there's no bun there's no unbundling where ESPN goes, but at least they're talking, which is which is news, and it means that one of these guys, one of these four guys, is 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 going to be able to strike a deal with ESPN to bring it. They, they're sounding positive. Yeah. Now, so tell me, uh, is this such a smart idea for ESPN? We've covered before how uh, ESPN is a major, major beneficiary of all these non-sports watchers uh, shelling out bucks in order to keep ESPN uh, being carried on cable, like. I, it's very forward thinking, and but but right now they have a huge benefit uh, on cable. Like it's as though all of cable is rigged in their favor. You know. No, but I think what they're saying in this article, man, is we want that. We're going to get that same benefit. We're totally willing to go internet, but we're going to get the same amount of money or more than we get from cable. And you're taking all of our our channels. That's our big deal with cable is you take ESPN, you got to take ESPNU and ESPN2 and, and the whole shebang. Wow. Oh, that's remarkable, man. Uh, hey, man, who's, uh, who's paying for this here episode of Frame Rate? Well, this episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies to you instantly. You may have heard us talk about them on the show. Uh, <laughs> there are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac or PC or iPad. You can watch them on your Nexus 7. You can watch them on your iPhone. You can watch them on your Android phone. If you have a gaming console, Xbox 360, PS3, Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV. You can get it on a Roku box. I use it on an Apple TV, a Roku box, and a Chromecast, all of them. And you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices. Begin watching a movie or show on one device, finish on a different one. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many TV shows and movies as you want. And here's the reason we're telling you about it right now. They are doing a solid to you. Netflix.com slash twit for 30 days free Netflix. If you're one of the people out there who said, well, I haven't actually tried Netflix yet. I'd like to give them a shot. Do it for free. 30 days. Netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for the free trial. And we thank Netflix for their support of twit. We hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. And uh, you can give that URL to anybody, even if you're already a Netflix subscriber. Works for them all. Let's see what's in the slipstream, shall we, Brian? Yes. Well, this one made some waves in the video world. Maker Studios, one of the biggest names on YouTube, they've made their name with your YouTube channel, bought Blip, a YouTube competitor. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about this because Blip is, I, and it makes sense because Blip, uh, for those of you who don't know, Blip is a uh, you know service that delivers video much in the way that YouTube does. It doesn't have uh, the same community that YouTube, it doesn't have the numbers in general. People don't view Blip.tv as a uh, 
uh, as a destination site the way they do with YouTube. Uh, but part of the reason a lot of independent producers liked to host their content on Blip was that they were able to strike monetization detail or deals that that didn't uh, that didn't conform to the 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 cookie cutter way that YouTube wants to deal with stuff. Uh, the the player itself didn't need to be branded Blip.tv. You could actually substitute the Blip.tv logo for your own logo, so it looked like your own independent productions um, independent streamer. So. Uh, for the same reasons that smaller guys, for example, um, uh, my friends over at Dad Lab, uh, Dad Labs, you used uh, Blip.tv Player embedded. Now they would also post a bunch of their content on YouTube, but if you're going to watch, they prefer that you watch uh, on the website using the Blip Player. Uh, for those same reasons, that vers that that versatility, uh, it makes sense. If you just got a crap ton more money, like it sounds like the folks over at Maker Studios have, then why not instead of using Blip.tv, just buy Blip.tv. And then, uh, and essentially, my, my guess is keep it all going the same way that it has been and get the same benefit out of it. Yeah, I think you start to be able to promote it. You'd be able to, to control the message, do some things there that you can't do on YouTube and monetize it. I think that's the biggest thing is they get a sales staff out of this. Uh, and, and right now, they're working with YouTube on sales, and I'm sure they'll continue to do that. That's too much of a cash cow for them to drop. But now they'll be able to sell some things directly, do some in-show promotions, et cetera, and they've got this blip staff that's uh, that's that's fairly experienced at this. It looks like everybody's going to stay. Even Blip CEO Kelly Day has been offered a job. It's just not CEO of Blip anymore. I guess that's going to be taken over by Maker. Interesting side note here, if you've been following it, Ray William Johnson left Maker. It was acrimonious. Everybody was saying the other person was at fault. He went to Blip. So now wow. he's going to end up. So now he's back uh, at Maker. <laughs> back under Maker. So we'll see how long he stays there. That's funny. Uh, Intel is one, of, as I mentioned earlier, one of the companies trying to bring the internet revolution in TV. They want to make a box. They want to strike deals. They haven't struck any yet. Brian Kurzanich had said, well, we're going to be real cautious with TV. That's something we're not very experienced about. However, they haven't stopped. They're still trying to strike the deals. They still plan to launch their box by the end of the year. We'll see if that happens. But they've opened up offices in LA and New York. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I've cooled off on my enthusiasm for Intel coming in and fixing everything. Yeah. I'm starting, yeah, just the more we, we parse this stuff out, the more these stories, the more we hear about the way, you know, the, the nasty tangled inner workings of all this. I, I don't know that just being an outsider is enough to, to simplify everything. So good luck. I mean, I, I certainly hope the best for Intel. I want somebody to come in and fix it, but, uh, we'll see. Oh, the key is the deals. And if they've got offices in Nolita, the section of New York that's near a lot of the New York studios, and they've got offices in Santa Monica, actually, not L.A., but close to a bunch of studio folks in Santa Monica. In fact, Santa Monica is where Amazon is. It's where Yahoo is over here. So it's, it's definitely the right area for Intel to be in to strike these deals. We'll see if it helps. Yeah. Also, Netflix rolled out the My List function, which for those of us in the U.S. is not as big of a deal. What it does is changes your instant queue to be auto-arranged. You can still change it back and make it manually arranged, but it'll automatically put what they think are the most important things in your queue up front based on your viewing habits. And they'll also notify you when new episodes are added to TV shows and where movies might be expiring soon because their deals are over. I think this is a bigger deal than you give it credit for because I had completely stopped using the instant queue feature because well, I hated well, let the me, fact let, let me clarify. It's a bigger deal for people internationally because they didn't even have an instant queue. And so now they actually get one. But Got go it. ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, but specifically, like, I had stopped using the instant queue feature because it was ranged in an order. Whatever last thing I happened to click was always at the front of the line. And then uh, and once you'd watch something, you would have to manually remove it from your instant queue because you didn't want to keep seeing it again. But now the fact that you just essentially are saying, dig this, uh, let's keep it on my radar. And the fact that it automatically, like, the moment there's a new season of Sons of Anarchy or whatever, puts that at the front of the queue, this hybrid of, of your input with their algorithms I think will work really, really well. Cool. Yeah, I'm liking it so far myself. Let's look at tube tops. And I don't mean... Yes, shirts. yes, you do. <laughs> I, I, I mean, let's no, let's devices, just take a moment and look at these tube tops. That sit on top of your television, delightful. except they don't sit on top of your television anymore. They're they sit not, below your television you? in most cases. Yeah, but... <laughs> Tube top. <laughs> we lost Brian. Device. Sorry. <laughs> Apple is said to be uh, eyeing HBO, Viacom, ESPN as TV partners. Uh, Quartz reported on Thursday people who claim to have knowledge 
of Apple's plans say that they're really doing a full court press. Now, this this seems true because ESPN added their watch ESPN to Apple TV. HBO added their HBO Go app uh, to Apple TV. And so apparently everything's on the board. Apple's saying we'll sell individual access, we'll sell general access and cut you in on that, and then people pay extra to get access to apps. We'll do a typical cable TV bundle. Hell, we'll even partner with cable TV providers if they'll partner with us. Just let us do the television, for goodness sakes. Yeah, uh, and I know none of this is Apple's fault, except insofar as their, uh, their leakier rumor structure than it used to be under Steve Jobs. Uh, none of these are official releases. Apple, of course, keeping their mouth shut about everything. But man, oh man, am I over being excited about an Apple TV. It's like, you know what? Uh, I, you got my ho hopes up enough times. Just call, call when you actually have something. And I know this is an Apple doing it. I know it's the media. At least get better with your media leaks so I don't have to hear more of these rumors because it's like I'm so getting jaded and you don't want me angry before your device even comes out. Tired of Intel, tired of Apple. What about Google? All right, Google's, I'm down. Google's I'm Chromecast. Down with uh, Google's Chromecast, this is bad news. Google's Chromecast now blocks you from using the Aircast or the, as they've uh -huh. renamed it, the Allcast app, which let you take videos off your phone and send them to Chromecast. The latest update to Chromecast broke that. Uh, well, the latest, latest update, I believe this was added since, yeah, this is the benefit. Let me tell you, Tom, if you're a real pro like me, you wait until 20 minutes before the show to read all the articles. That way you're <laughs> able to catch little tidbits like this. At the bottom of that article, uh, the, the, the allegation was that the guy who did all cast said, I don't know, but the latest update definitely broke my app. Uh, think of that's intentional because Google is being coy. Never said about, it was intentional. About stuff. I right, said right, it no, 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 but, okay. but, right, but, that, but that was the allegation. Uh, however, Google finally uh, just offered the following uh, uh, release. He says, uh, we're excited to bring more content to Chromecast and would like to support all types of apps, including those for local content. So uh, it seems like maybe it just was an accident that broke it. And, uh, and, I, I, and now for the first it. time, for the first time, we have Google on the record as saying, no, we want the Chromecast to be able to play your local content. And that well, is huge. So that, it's a positive. They said we would like to support. Didn't say they will. That's true. Uh, but also... The guy who made the Aircast or, or Allcast app reverse engineered the Chromecast API. He wasn't using yeah. an SDK because the SDK isn't out there for everybody yet. It's way early days. Google says that in their response. Everyone freaked out and said, oh, they're, they're blackballing. No, they're not. Some guy reverse engineered something and then they updated the software. And guess what happens when you update software and don't test something because you don't actually know that it exists? Have an it SDK, breaks. sure. That happens. That's yeah. what's that's what programming is all about. That's why you do quality assurance testing. I'm not going to do quality assurance testing for some guy's independent app that was reverse engineered. I, but I also don't think Google intentionally tried to break it either. So I would hope that they would actually see this as, as something they would want to support in the future. It's still, it's still a question whether they're going to open up that SDK as widely as people would like. Well, and keep in mind also, there is a legitimate reason for them to not want to do it. I mean, when you, when it comes to playing local media, you run into entanglements. And if they're trying to score, you know, media partnerships and there are people who would be like, well, we'd prefer this wasn't a play any old video file from anywhere talking about you, you know, uh, Mr. Pirate Bay. Then, um, you know, I could see there being a reason for that. So it, it is a concern, but uh, but it looks like they're coming down on the side of of freedom of choice. They still leave themselves room in that statement to not support this kind of app in the future, too. I think. Oh that's yes, I I totally yeah. agree with that. But but it's still now, even if they're making noise for the wrong reasons, they're still making noises I like. TV TiVo, I mean, has got some new boxes out. The Romeo, the two hundred dollar Romeo, I don't think should be called Romeo. It's spelled R O A M I O. The Romeo Plus at four hundred dollars and the Romeo Pro at six hundred dollars have different storage uh, features and different number of tuners. Uh, but the Roam means that you're actually able to cast any video from your TiVo to an app, whether you're on your home network or not. Before, the uh, the TiVo streamer had to be available, and then you could only use it in your own house. The problem is if you go buy one of these TiVos, which you can buy right now, it won't be able to do the roaming thing yet. They say that that's, that's a, an app that's coming soon. It'll come to iOS first and then Android later. Uh, dude, that's great. And I'll tell you what, we're finally far enough into my cord cutting experience that I'm starting to look towards my net, you know, my first, you know, OTA ah. set top box. And so certainly I'm taking auditions now, TiVo. It'd be wonderful to have you back in my life. $400 for a set top box? 
uh, won't even blink. I mean, that's uh, I mean, not and that's not a statement of of like like I just got money to burn. But like, no, no, I'll no. tell you this much: when you're when you're off cable, when you give up that eighty bucks a month to get the same packages that everyone's force fed, was that it's four months, five months? You got that covered? Like you get a big budget to work with when you cut cable out of your life. What about film film? That's the stuff that we like to watch. Let's see if this makes you blink, Brian Brushwood. Ben <laughs> Affleck will play Batman. I was on the road when this story broke, uh, so I never read anything. I read first the ONG tweets, uh, Ben Affleck, then the backlash, like, oh, great, it's going to suck, blah, blah, blah. Um, let me, let me, look, I've already seen the script. The script goes, everybody's skeptical, and then he does a fine job. Because let me tell you, Ben Affleck knows how to tell a story. He knows how to act uh, when the project's right. They're going to put enough money in this. They're not going to let it be Daredevil. The situations that create a Daredevil are not the situations that are going into this next story. Ben Affleck is a fine actor. It's, it's going to be great. And you're all going to be amazed. And then you're going to find this video and be all like, Brian saw the script of life. And then you're going to ask me when you die and I'll tell you, but then you're going to weep uncontrollably. For then you're going to wish you hadn't asked. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, uh, I think you're, I, I don't have anything to add to that. Other than, come on, people. You're like, oh, he was great in Argo in the town. And then he gets cast as Batman and everyone suddenly, all they could think of is Gigli. Or whatever. Yeah. However you say that. <laughs> Gigli, yeah. 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 Neil Gaiman has provided an update on American Gods. If you don't realize, HBO has the rights to create a television series. Gaiman has been working on a third draft of the pilot's script and recently handed it in. Uh, he has radically expanded on the original novel with new scenes showing the bank robbery that went wrong and landed Shadow in prison, et cetera, et cetera. We still don't know when we might get a firm commitment from HBO that this will start shooting in air. They, they've got a packed schedule. Yeah, it's tough because on the one hand, you're all like, look, HBO, you already saw when you take awesome, beloved, uh, you know, book franchises of fantasy material and turn them into awesome shows, you make all the money on the planet. So why not just do that again? But there's a lot of considerations here. You know, for all we know, for all we know, they've done this deal with America Gods. But meanwhile, behind the scenes, maybe they're they're looking at optioning the Dark Tower series. I mean, you know, it's it's there are reasons why they don't have to just jump in and start producing right away, no matter how good the the book American Gods are or how perfect that world is to expand. Um, the, 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 we don't know what where HBO's heads at or what they're thinking of doing, and so we shouldn't pretend like the the decision for them is obvious. Now, Sony also has uh, got a development deal to do a Watch Dogs movie. Uh, Ubisoft has, has signed over some rights. That doesn't mean it's going to get shot either. It's it's you know for, it's in in one of those limbos where it could sit on the shelf forever. But it does seem like a lot of game companies are striking deals with movies, and I, I I think movie studios may be looking at video games now no longer as the like eh we could put it out cheaply and maybe get some kids to come into the theater like Mario, Pac Man, etc. I think they're looking at it as these are great stories. We need to figure out how to make good video game movies because people are going to get tired of comic book movies sooner or later, and we have to I'll have tell some you other kind of blockbuster. I'll, I'll tell you kind of one of the make or break things is uh, a friend of the show, Cargill. Um, uh, wait, I don't know. What, yeah, no, I think this is all public. I think I could say this. If if not, then I apologize, Cargill. But uh, but uh, Cargill is attached to the, the Deus Ex script. And um, uh, Deus Ex, if, if it does well and proves that you could have a really good story that comes from a video game world, uh, which we've almost seen. Right now, believe it or not, uh, do you know what the number one movie to or, or video game to movie translation of all time is right now i don't know it was a final fantasy you've asked me this before and i should know yeah uh, i oh shoot now i can't remember it's either final fantasy <laughs> or tomb raider tomb raider and final <laughs> fantasy are the only ones uh but like third place uh in that is uh is uh, uh prince of persia sands of time which didn't do very well but in terms of video game movies did extraordinarily well so uh we we have seen these these things almost be box office successes uh, i don't think we've seen any that have been a critical success. I think uh, I think Final Fantasy, and, and I may be also confusing the box office numbers for the Rotten Tomatoes reviews on there, but like uh, in general, if you look at video game movies on Rotten Tomatoes, it's astonishing how bad all of the movies are, just universally. Even if they do well financially, they're all just bad movies. Uh, if that changes, you know, and it could be like, uh, it'd be neat if Deus Ex 
was one of the ones that changed it. It was part of that uh, that changing landscape. Then I think you, I think we will see a gold rush. I think for right now we're seeing a lot of hedging of bets because, as best I could tell, nobody's cracked that transformative code. Nobody's been able to take something that's a really good deep story in a video game and make it a really good deep story in a movie just yet. They're arming up. They're good. they're striking the deals because it, the feeling is. It's about to break out. People are about to figure this out. Somebody's going to make a hit out of a video game movie and then the gold rush is on. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Let's move on to scan lines. We don't have an intro for scan lines. Oh. <laughs> but if you would like to make us one. If you would like to make us one, please. <laughs> please do. Scan lines. Yeah, it can be. I'll just do this, I'll just do this real thing. fast. We'll get some artifacting yeah. on there. You can get Miley Cyrus scanlines? to dance. Oh, yeah, I see those. There you go. That's cool. Done. Uh, scan lines, of course, means we have 60 seconds per story to discuss it. And of course, each of us can extend a story by 60 seconds if we want. Uh, you start, or, or am I starting, Brian? Okay, uh, uh, you know what? You take that first one. All right. Yahoo's Marissa Meyer turning into a media mogul with Katie Couric, says all things D. Uh, essentially, the idea is that through their partnership with ABC, whom Katie Couric is working for, Yahoo is going to create original series with Katie Couric. And they're saying this is a turn at Yahoo to focus on media. Marissa Meyer has been focusing almost entirely on product at Yahoo, but she doesn't want to abandon media and she wants to do it through partnerships, not Yahoo creating original content themselves. I think this is probably really smart and it's certainly in brand, you know, if uh, uh, to, to the digerati, the type of people who are even aware of frame rate and watching it, it's obvious that, you know, we tend to be Google type of people. We like the Google mindset. We like the Google search engine. Yahoo is very much a, a, middle America search engine. And so as a result, you want to go with traditional, you know, middle America stars and uh, a big name like Katie Couric, I think is a good uh, way to do it as is a partnership like this kind of thing, instead of creating original content. Yeah. Not targeted at the frame rate already. It's targeted at the mainstream audience. Also Correct. Couric should play Meyer in the made for TV movie. <laughs> Netflix steals Weinstein movies away from Showtime. Uh, the story here is that uh, basically they're getting uh, movies from Weinstein and its Dimension Films outlet to Netflix during what industry insiders like to call the pay TV windows. So this, again, this isn't like you're just going to see everything all at once, but this is these are deals that will get new content coming in at different times than they otherwise might have scored. How big a deal is this? Is this going to shut down your interest in Showtime because now it's available in the same time or an no, earlier no, time I don't, Netflix? I don't think it's expected to shut down your interest in Showtime. It's just another example that Netflix is a player right in there with HBO and Showtime. They're no longer even like a second tier player. They start in 2016. You're going to start seeing Netflix be required for some people because they're going to have big movies that are hitting for the first time on television, and you're going to have to have Netflix to watch them. That's a big deal. Yeah, when you say, how long until we start seeing Netflix bundled? I, I, ah, that's too, too big a thing. I don't want to go to the extension. Well, yeah, next story. Forget about it. <laughs> All right. Time Warner Cable and CBS are still fighting, and it doesn't look like it's going to get any better soon because Time Warner started what is a typical maneuver, usually earlier in a fight, by handing out free antennas to its customers so that they can get CBS. If you don't know the story, CBS and Time Warner are fighting over the carriage fee that allows Time Warner to provide CBS's over-the-air broadcast through the cable lines. So I have a question for you, Tom. Sure, Given, Brian. Now, now, this is a move that they've done several times okay, before. Algebra. It's a way... It's a way for them to say, look, we want you to have CBS. CBS is being big babies, asking us to pay too much. Here, have a free antenna. You can watch it over the air. Does this story change at all in a post aerial world where we have seen uh, CBS howl so loud about uh, about people circumventing uh, uh, the, 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 the retransmission fees? Is there a different message behind this? I don't think so. I think I think it's the same old, same old, because people just don't want to use antennas. It's, it's a desperate maneuver on Time Warner's part. There we go. Paramount considered a new Star Trek TV series last year. Did you know about this, Tom? Not until I found this story on the Word Zone. Nice yeah, stuff. Uh, so, okay. So I guess the talk is, and, and I can't tell if they meant specifically it was to be a Michael Dorn series or if they be just speculated. Produced, or it was going to be Michael Dorn run and Star Wharf. Yeah. Well, I, like okay, Worf as an older thing. man or something? Or well, and, and, and what if stylistically, now here's the thing is, of course, the question is, uh, will the Star Trek TV show take place in the original timeline or the rebooted timeline that we see with the movies? Um, I could see something that took place in the original timeline starring Worf 
as maybe a vigilante badass who's retired from Fed Federation or whatever, or maybe he's an ambassador in a filthy land. He has to kick a lot of ass. Uh, I could see that being shot in the style of the rebooted world, but keeping to the original timeline. And I think that could have been good. Yeah, and I, I think they decided, you know, we don't want to take away from Abrams right now. So hopefully they cut, they recircle back and do this again. Yeah. Sylvester Stallone and director John Hertzfeld are reaching out on Kickstarter to get the last $250,000 they need for their movie, Reach Me. Uh, this is a star-studded picture. It's got all kinds of folks you recognize in there. Kelsey Grammer, Nelly, bunch of the guy who played E on Entourage. And they basically decided, you know what? We don't have enough money because one of our investors backed out to finish post-production. We want to put this out in November. We have distribution. We just need a little money. And they decided to go to Kickstarter for it. You know what? And uh, let's face it, for this kind of movie, this level of, of production, you know, that's it's a bit of pocket change. And, and granted, it's enough pocket change that it would be a pain in the ass for them to find another investor to make happen. But uh, but I, I, I don't, I'm not against fans funding this stuff as long as the benefits are tangible and the reason for it makes sense. Um, you know, I don't know how to feel about this one. By the way, I owe you a stake, Tom Merritt, because Spike Lee got funded. Yeah. Also, mm. Harry Knowles has got a Kickstarter. If you read the comments about it. Uh, yeah, man, that's that's a hell of a thing. Uh, a lot of backlash against uh, Harry Knowles trying to extend his uh, Nerdist show beyond the original one. It's your, it's your story now. What? Oh, I thought that was the last one. Dang it. No, we have six. Ah, uh, dude. And then this is the one I didn't read. Uh, XBMC Media Center hits the Ouya store. Uh, I'm going to guess from the headline I, I, on this one that yeah, the XBMC Media this. Center hit the Ouya store. It did. And I downloaded it and I tried it and it's buggy. It's uh, definitely XBMC. It just doesn't fit very well with the controller. And I don't know how much of that is a problem with the Ouya interface or how much is a problem with the port. It's not run by the actual XBMC guys. Uh, it's, a, it's a third party, Chris Browett, uh, doing the port. Now, he didn't do a bad job or anything. It's just a little bit clumsy. First attempt. A lot of people say if you sideload XBMC onto the Ouya yourself, it works better. So if you're thinking, oh, I have an Ouya, or I can get a cheap Ouya and turn it into a, a cheap media center, you probably can, but it's going to take a lot more tweaking than it sounded like when I first read this story, which is, hey, I can just download it from the Ouya store. Done. I don't mind the tweaking. It's the twerking that disturbs. Yeah, don't don't twerk your Ouya because it'll get stuck. <laughs> Give it to Miley Cyrus. All right. Uh, movie draft. Let's talk about the movie draft. Brian wins. People, people are bagging on on one of my picks. Uh, they're saying that uh, that there was a disappointing premiere for uh, The World's End. Um, you know, and that's weird to me, it. too, because I, I wanted to go see The World's End this weekend, and all the showings were sold out. They were either sold out or it was one of those movie theaters with assigned seating where the only seats we could get would be right in front. So we ended yeah. up seeing Elysium instead. Let me see. How many theaters is it releasing to right now? Um, Maybe it's it looks release. Yeah, it's only in 1,500 theaters, which is oh, about a third many. of what you'd yeah. expect for a major release. Um, so it, it could be doing very well in those theaters, but uh, but not make a lot of money uh, overall. But uh, right now, with an opening weekend of around $9 million, it's not going to hit the $40 million I was expecting it to. So it looks like instead of plowing past a billion, I'm just going to limp past a billion. But uh, Poor, poor Brian. You know what won this season for you is Despicable Me too. I mean, oh, Iron, Man, Iron Man 3 was not... Any any bad item for you to have, but Despicable no. Me Too was the score. Despicable Me Too was the buy of the entire season. Uh, I bought it for twenty dollars, and so far it's made three hundred and fifty million, which means it made. Now we say that what you want to target, you want to get around ten million dollars per buck spent if you want to get you know an average of a billion, uh, which is usually about what the winner gets. This thing got seventeen million for every dollar spent on it, so it makes it the uh, the number one. Uh, uh, the 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 number one by number two, I think, was you, wasn't it? No, uh, I'm yeah, way back number there. two. Nope, nope. It's uh, it's uh, the heat was the number two best buy. Oh, of the you mean number thing. one buy? I'm sorry, I'm number four in total. But you're right, the heat ended up being a great purchase. If I hadn't screwed up and bought After Earth, and if planes hadn't been so awful, then I, I might have had a chance. But even then, this, I don't think I could have gone. This whole this whole summer, and we've said it before. This whole summer was was. One, by not buying a stinker. There were so many surprise bombs. Yep. Uh, every single person had at least one movie that took an unfortunate dump. And uh, and and that's and I guess I just lucked out in that 
everything. Well, except for the world's end, but but that's such a small player at the end. It I underestimated matter. Despicable Me too. That was that was actually a, a big flaw in my strategy too. Yeah. Well, premiering this week, we'll kick off next week on Frame Rate. Uh, as far as what's coming out this week, not much. It's Labor Day weekend, a lot of indie movies, nothing that's even getting, I don't know, R. Nixon got 93% Rotten Tomatoes, but uh, nothing. most of the stuff is, is getting less than 50%. So, uh, Can I, can I point out that we do have, hang on, before we wrap up real quick to the chat realm top 50, if you take a look at draft.msfwshow.com. Uh, oh, oh, uh, right now, there's still a fight. Uh, we've got Crew SML is currently number one with 1 billion, 98 million. Uh, and he's out of movies though. Planes was his last movie. Chimera in the chat is at 1 billion, 93 million. He's only 5 million away from overtaking the top spot and he has the world's end. So if war the world's end outpaces, yeah. oh, and he has planes. So really, I think I think Chimera yeah, just planes. won it. The world's end is gonna get 5 million next weekend and then Chimera wins. That's, That's great, man. Congratulations, yeah. Chimera. That's fantastic. Crew SML, congratulations to you if we're wrong somehow. But I kind of yeah. don't think we're wrong. Let's yeah. talk about what we're watching. What we're watching. We're going to do a, uh, a Breaking Bad spoiler zone, aren't we? Yeah? Do you watch yes. it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I did. I watched it. Okay, this that'll be good. Cool. And you're watching The Shield again? Uh, well, I mentioned that. Like, uh, it's 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 a good. I, I started it just oh, right. to you did see. Say you're rewatching to see if yeah, it held I, up. I forgot. It, exactly, but but it's filling this niche where it's like it's after midnight, and it's something that I already know the story, so I'm not going to get so swept into that I'll feel bad shutting it off halfway through. You know, if if like you know around right. twelve forty five, I get tired or whatever. So, uh, but it's it's great, and I'll tell you, we we were bagging on the uh, the Amazon interface. I love going to Amazon, going to the store shelf, seeing it, seeing the price tag with a line through it and just says free. I just, I don't know. There's something about that feels different from the Netflix experience that I enjoy that on my computer. Yeah, that's cool. I, uh, I'm falling behind on Under the Dome and it's not intentional. It's not like I've given up. I just, it's gone to the bottom of my priority list. So I'd be interested if, if I get back to it. Uh, I'm still watching Continuum, Top Chef Masters. I'm a big Top Chef fan. Futurama, obviously Breaking Bad. But I, I watched fewer episodes of television this week because I got into the Hearthstone beta from Blizzard. That's their, oh, wow. their, their trading card, on, online trading card game. And uh, wow, I, I totally got sucked into that. And I played that a lot. Plus Plants vs. Zombies 2 on the iPad. It's funny. I've noticed this with you too. When, when, when you've gotten sucked into a new video game, it tends to take away from your TV watching time. I wonder if that's a little bit of a zero-sum game. I think it may be. I think there's a budget for it's like you got you got family time, you got you got work time like this, and then you got that the the selfish play time, the stuff where it's like you know certain appointment TV watching you got to watch with your significant other or your kids or whatever. Uh, but uh, when an, a game comes out, especially if it's one that's appropriate for my kids to watch, because uh, this whole week when I have had time, it's been a very busy week, but I had a day off, and all I did was play uh, King's Bounty uh, Warriors of the North with my with my kid the whole time and. That's all time I normally would have probably gotten caught up on other media. But it's, uh, yeah, man, video games are awesome. Let's get some feedback in this now house. Now time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Rate, oh yeah. Our first piece of feedback comes from Scott in Detroit, Michigan. Says, I am a football fanatic. American. My usual classification would be a cord cutter, but sports ball makes it difficult to fully cut the cord. I like my college, my pro, and while I can get my local pro football team via over the air in HD, it's really college football and Monday night football that I am missing out on as a cord cutter with ESPN and the Big Ten Network. Thankfully, my internet provider allows me to upgrade and downgrade with no contract commitments or install costs. Wow. NCAA football season starts August 29th, and on that day, I have my provider scheduled to come over and install a cable box and activate an HD package with the channels I need for my football fix. When bowl season is over in January, I'll cancel cable TV and go back to my internet-only entertainment. This ends up being $40 a month for 15 megabit internet for the better part of eight months and TV plus internet at $70 a month for a little more than four months. I guess I would be classified as a seasonal cord cutter or maybe a migratory cord cutter, like a bird who heads south in the winter. I get cable as the season approaches. I love that. 
You know, and and it's like my expectation is to keep the cable cut, keep the cord cut, but uh, you know, it's going to get harder as Game of Thrones comes back. I'm going to start wondering, like, well, maybe I'll just sign up for a couple of months and then cancel. Maybe so we'll I'll see. Just do a little of that dish more flim flam to get the HBO Go. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Touche. Sorry, I forgot about the dish flim flam. Now we're talking. Don't uh, forget about uh, the dish flim flam. This one here says. Hi, Brian. I'd be interested to know your thoughts on this. Netflix had parental controls so that you could log into your account and restrict access to videos based on four age-related settings. Since profiles were added, you can set which profile has age restrictions. But when my nine-year-old runs Netflix on the PS3, he can just choose his older brother's profile Oops. or mine and start watching what he likes. I think the solution is to add optional quick access pin for certain profiles, James, in the UK. Uh, that's not a bad idea or have some kind of code that you got to figure out. But let me, let me, let me, for comparison, understand how awesome we are to, to be in this position now where, where you have this level of control. Because I was thinking about this the other day. Like, you know, I've got a nine-year-old now and I'm trying to manage what kind of content that she watches because I don't want to break her brain. I think back to the crap I would find myself watching uh, on HBO or, or even like, you know, Playboy Channel or whatever, when there's no restrictions and you could use the tuner to see naked ladies or whatever. Uh, it uh, It is remarkable to me that we have this level of control for what our kid sees. Um, like I was thinking about it. Do you realize, Tom, that I was, I was flipping around channels when I was in second grade and ran across um, probably the most horrific scene in all of A Clockwork Orange? Uh, it, it was, uh, I, I don't know what, what that did to me, if anything at all, you know, you never know. But it's like, I'm thrilled that that this is the level of discussion that we're having now. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking through too to see, and anybody in the chat room who knows about this, let us know if there's any other way to set parental controls. It says to set parental controls for other profiles, you must switch to that profile. There's no way to put, I guess, can you put a password on the individual profiles? Probably, I guess not. Let's see. If that, it's not there now, it'll be there in 20 minutes, I'm sure. They're they're clearly moving in the right direction. And the fact that they even have profiles now means that they're going to figure out the next next logical step is to allow people to password and protect their particular thing. Yeah. Now, it's a good, it's a good uh, question. Thanks for the email, James. And then finally, uh, Jeff in Salt Lake City says, I just want to comment about the Pixar people must be feeling horrible about planes comment on show 137. Here's the problem. Everything that comes out of Disney that is animated, including Pixar, Disney Animation, and Disney Toon Studios, is run by Mr. Pixar, John Lasseter. When Disney fully absorbed Pixar, this was one of the first changes they made in the internal structure, was making sure that John Lasseter would be involved in every animated thing that Disney released. Planes was a made-for-TV feature, and I've heard this from several people, and its generic story reflects that. Hopefully, Disney will learn from this experience and focus on releasing quality features to theaters and keep lesser quality projects on the Disney Channel. Agreed. That came from uh, Jalen Jade. Congratulations on your third-place victory in the chat realm draft. I noticed. Nice. Good job, Jeff. And that brings us to the end of Frame Rate. Brian Brushwood, a pleasure to be like back in the groove now. Yeah, man. Uh, if only we could shake things up even crazier and like have you out in this studio sometime. We'll just have to add that one to the list of things to try. <sighs> yeah, I'll wish very hard. And then maybe <laughs> that always works. <laughs> maybe my wishes will come true. Right, uh, in enough. the meantime, don't forget about the uh, Chicken Challenge Google Plus profile. I don't have the link of the show notes today, but we created just just search Chicken Challenge on Google Plus. You'll see a picture of Brian kind of challenging you as yeah, like kind of like that. And uh, you can you can share your tips. It, what's really cool is what's happening is as people share their stories about calling and, and canceling cable and what kind of deals they get, other people are starting to say, yeah, I read this guy's thing about the chicken challenge. And so that inspired me to say this and I was able to get this. And so it's all like turning into this helping each I, other community, which is awesome. It's self it's self replicating now, right? It's about to become yeah, sentient and take over the world. <laughs> it's bigger than us already. Exactly. It's totally out of our control. We can't stop it. It's too big. It's bigger than both of us, Brian. Too big to fail. Uh, so check that out. Also check out our website, twit.tv slash FR for all the episodes all the time. You can email us, framerate at twit.tv and uh, you can find Stick us around. live on Mondays. Stick around for the spoiler zone. Yeah, find us live on Mondays at 3.30 Pacific, 4.30 Mountain Time. Spoiler alert. Like we're going to have a spoiler zone. Oh, you totally spoiled that, man. Silent Green!
feed his people! So, this is me at 45 minutes into Breaking Bad this week, Brian. <sighs> you know, those first two episodes are pretty crazy. This one seems a little slower. I wonder if that's just in comparison. <laughs> and this is Eileen. Both those episodes, all the stuff happened at the end. Hang in there. So, uh, I actually was not bored going into it. Now, first of all, um, well, yeah. No, don't, don't get me wrong. I wasn't bored, but I felt like, eh, okay, not as much seems to be happening this time. Yeah, so uh, let's see what all what all happened. Uh, uh, the I guess let's work backwards from the ending, right? The the ending, uh, the big the big moment was clearly lines have been drawn. Jesse Pinkman is out to destroy Walter. He had a realization that Walter is manipulative and controlling him. And even even in that scene where Jesse's trying to get Walter, like just look me in the eye, just freaking level with me, just tell me you killed Mike and that you that you're gonna kill me if I don't get the hell out of town. Be honest and. And because Walter is so good at playing people, he he refuses. He measures he measures Jesse's resolve. Realizes that he could just give him a hug and get him to crumble, and he does. And he just is defeated and decides to skip town, start a new life. Um, I wasn't crazy about the reveal of I, I, like just the fact that uh, I, I understand that they did a moment where they lifted the pot off of him, and that you know he realizes, oh, people can lift things off of me. Oh, what if what if he stole the rice and cigarette? What if it was like I wish there was a more concrete his level of of how sure he was about being manipulated, I thought was disproportionate to the evidence that he had just gotten. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was a little confused actually when he when he pulls out the cigarette pack and realizes, oh crap. I was like, now is he realizing that Walt was responsible for the ricin or which is what it turned out to be? Or is he like freaking out about changing his life, you know, like and and realizing that he doesn't want to do this? And a couple other possibilities flitted through my mind. I can't remember now, but it, it wasn't clear to me. Although I figured the rice and thing was because that was the same brand of cigarettes. That was the pack. But yeah, right. you're right. It, it felt a little bit of a jump that he would have that intense of a reaction at that point, given where his mind had supposedly been. Yeah, but I didn't care once he started heading, T right? tearing once stuff up. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like Jesse uh, is on the march, and this me, is awesome. Uh, to me, the uh, the the best moment of the whole episode is um, the is the moment of trust that I have for Breaking Bad when uh, he sits down to give his confession, and Skyler's like, "Are you sure this is the right thing to do?" He's like, "Yeah, it's our, it's our only play." And then they go to commercial or whatever, and then and then. You don't know what happened. And this happens, what, like 35 minutes in or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, and I remember thinking like, well, what can it be? He can either admit or he can do a fake out. I mean, and then part of me was like, just trust it. It's breaking bad. Whatever it is, it'll be good. And boy, was it as a power play move on Wald, who has no cards at this point, uh, right. and yet is able to utterly- He like created walk. cards out of nothing. Yes, yes. It was fantastic. I really dug it. Uh, that was a great moment. And it- they also have done a great job of uh, of creating a believable reason why Hank, who is you know clearly furious and enraged and wants nothing more in the world to have one goddamn win and take down Walter White, be the guy to catch his white whale, uh, can't do it because he's trapped in too many of these things. You know, the moment last episode with that that agonizing moment where Marie was trying to take the kid, and then. You know, the fact this episode where it's like, you know, he's he's received hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical uh, money from, uh, you know, from Walter White. And, and the fact that um, that now it, there's a believable if if this is how it was going to go down, there'd be all this evidence. They're like, well, here's a crap ton of money that is in your account that definitely came from cooking meth. And and he's saying that you're the one who did it. How is that not true? Uh, it's It's a great checkmate. And I and it, it sets up a believable moment for why this wild card of Jesse Pinkman going off the deep end that we're seeing right now at the end could be what ultimately tips the scales all, all told. And I love how they so carefully crafted Walt's confession. And I like you, when, when they said, I've got a confession, they went to break, I'm like, okay, it's not a confession. He's not going to capitulate. That 
That's, I mean, we know that he went on the run. I'm like, I guess they could do some kind of twisty thing with that, but I'm like, I don't know where this is going, but I know it's not a confession. I can't wait to see what it is. And once it was revealed, it was so well done. Very so, satisfying. Such a great example of salting a lie with so much truth that it is almost impossible not to believe. Well, and that's what we've seen up until now is that he's uh, he's he's been he's a master, amazing at it, at it right? Um, it's it's that whole it's that whole Fight Club thing of of once you've given up everything, you're free to do anything. Like he's got nothing to lose; he fully expects yeah. to die, and and he feels like you know his only concern is to take care of the. And to be honest, there's part of me where we're seeing how dark it's gotten now. I think that Walter White fully understood the consequences from day one when he decided to cook meth. I think he knew what path he was going on to, what would happen to him personally, what a demon he would become. And that's why none of this bothers him is because, you know, he accepted all of that the moment he made that first decision. And the one thing he's kept consistent all the way up until this, where it's just like, you keep that money, you spend it on the kids. That's yeah. all, that's all he's been about. You know, and, you know, there's talk, and there, there are certainly themes of, you know, we see his anger with getting screwed in the in the previous lifetime that he had, and the, of wanting to make a mark on the world, and all these things. I think all of these are are minor compared to uh, compared to the the core decision of of leaving his family well funded. And he's persuaded Skyler over to his side. All Skyler wanted him to do was stop cooking meth. She's like, you don't have to give back the money. We, you know, we've got more money than we'll ever need. You're done. Yeah, she was yeah. the one who got him to to realize that it was okay to stop, and he realized it was okay to stop because that is what he was in it for. And Did you, uh, he is he is so angry at Marie and Hank not because they want to catch him, but because they want to take away what he has done money. for his family and possibly try to take away his family. I mean, when they when they try to make a play for Walt Jr., he's he's not having it. And another master manipulative moment where he's like, now you just go on over to Marie's now. And he knew, he knew Walt Jr. wasn't going to go. It was right. brilliant. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's that whole, we're seeing the, the, the figurative and, you know, you can make it a case for practically the literal selling of his soul to corrupt him into something that's the antithesis of everything he was in order to, to do this. I mean, it's, it's a real life Faustian bargain he made and we're seeing that through all the way to the end. People are asking if uh, we enjoyed the uh, table guacamole scene, which I loved. Yeah. It was so perfectly awkward. It was amazing. By uh, the way, I, a, lot of, a lot of people don't know that you do this, but the first thing I thought when that waiter came over was, hi, I'm Brian. I'll be your customer today. Would you like to start me off with a beverage? Yeah, that's a, that's a bit <laughs> of business. Exactly that, that kind of place. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, let's see if there's any more uh, comments from the chat room that we have here. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything new. Uh, but, uh, dude, I'm glad everyone in the in the chat room is enjoying it as much as we are. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, minor note. But if you notice, they don't leave the CD. I call it a CD because I believe it's a VCD, not a DVD. <laughs> yes. Um, but <laughs> they don't leave that until the end of the conversation. There was still a chance for for Hank and Marie to avoid this. That was that was their they'll... dead man switch. That was the we're exactly. going to go, we're going to talk, and if we can't see reason, we are agreed that this is. And that's the weird part is seeing uh, seeing Skyler be the good wife in all this. Like she has gotten hard and and um, it's amazing. Go back and watch that first episode and look at the loveless, uh, sad marriage that they were in, and now look at the loveless badass marriage they're in now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, she's just, not a good wife. Good. She's not being a good wife. She's being a solid partner. Well, she's being a good crime. mom and in that way. She's being yeah, a mom she's of being a good doing mom, what it takes. Yeah. But this doesn't have to do, I don't think this has to do with love of Walt so much no, as I all. need to make this come off. She's doing it for the same reason, for the family. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right, man. Well, I guess that's it for this uh, spoiler zone. Make sure to send us emails. Let us know if you if you dig yeah. the spoiler zone and uh, what else we should spoil. Maybe we'll yeah. Maybe maybe when there's not really good TV, maybe we could just pick up a project like The Wire, like we did, and do another challenge. Sure. And yeah. Run the, some people are like, why didn't you do this show? Why didn't you do that show? Well, Brian and I both have to watch it 
for us to be able to do the spoiler zone or it doesn't work. And we uh, we mentioned, I don't know if we mentioned it during the show, but last time we mentioned like maybe breaking out the spoiler zone separately as its own feed. We'd probably still leave it at the end of frame rate for those who like it that way. Uh, and I ran that by Lisa Kensel, the CEO of Twitch. She said she'd get back to me. She's going to look right into on. it. So we'll, well see. cool. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye. We got to have a better wrap up for the spoiler zone. But -dun -dun. Well, don't just take our word for it. Watch it for yourself. Here's one to grow on. Do, 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 do. I'll see the you more guys on Thursday. You watch. Hey, that's Patrick Delahanty. I will Hello, see Hello, Patrick Delahanty. Hey. Oh, we should, we should give a uh, programming note that uh, tonight, uh, I guess what, we're about 10 minutes away from starting this week in YouTube. Won't be just any night. Uh, but tonight we're doing NSFW one night early because I have a show in Colorado Springs tomorrow. <laughs> So it'll be uh, Justin and I. So stick around for this week in YouTube. I'll probably go live on the pre-show for NSFW in uh, less than an hour. Well, I'll do it shortly before 8 p.m. And uh, it's going to be just me and Justin. Uh, got a bunch of stuff that we want to run through. Maybe, maybe Patrick, do you want to join us since you'll be there uh, for Dragon Con? You'll be around, right? Yeah, I'll be here. Right on, sir. It's going to be great. And we talked about uh, options for covering um, the NSFW live during that time as well. So... I will Ops. see you guys later on. Adios. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.